In October 1986, Newswatch editor Delegiwa was assassinated at his home using a letter bomb, also known as a parcel bomb. The question therefore is, who killed Delegiwa and why? In this edition of Hispul Media, we re-examine the story of the assassination of Delegiwa. We will answer the question, who killed Delegiwa and why? In January 1985, Four influential journalists, Delegiwa, Re Ekpu, Dan Agbese, and Yakubu Muhammad founded the magazine called Newswatch. Delegiwa was the editor-in-chief and CEO of the magazine. He left his position as editor of Moshuda Biola's Sunday Concord to found Newswatch. The magazine initially had a friendly relationship with the Babangida administration and was viewed as a relatively right-wing journal. In its early days, the magazine gave favorable assessments of the Babangida's regime. At first, Delegiwa was regarded as a reporter with intimate knowledge of the inner workings of the government. Consequently, the Babangida regime was eager to establish close relations with journalists in its early days. Brigadier Aliyu Muhammad, his personal confidant and the head of the National Security Organization NSO held regular press briefings with reporters. While aiming to expand the government network of press contact, Brigadier Mohammed reached out to Delegiwa on the recommendation of Dr. Stanley Mesboa, managing director of the Guardian newspaper, who saw Giwa as a rising star. Giwa was also well regarded by Ibrahim Babangida that he granted him an interview in the November 1985 issue of Newswatch. He was well connected, had access to, and was trusted enough to interview the head of state. The question you may want to ask is, what went wrong? What led to his assassination? How did a well-known trailblazing journalist who had worked for the country's wealthiest man and had the ears of the head of the National Security Organization finish up at odds with the administration he was courting. Well, reporters and newspaper editors did not appear to realize that the government's regular interaction with them had a hidden agenda. They did not realize at first that the head of the national security was not briefing them for selfless reasons. The government's regular contact with members of the press enabled it to watch and monitor the disposition of individual editors from close quarters as well as identify critical part of the praise. The federal military government's problem with Newswatch began in 1986 when the Directorate of Military Intelligence DMI summoned Giwa for questioning. The DMI alleged that Dele Giwa had a copy of the Special Military Tribunal's decision in the Maman Vasa coup case and that he intended to publish it in Newswatch. On September 19, 1986, after releasing an article about the federal military government's introduction of a second-tier foreign exchange market, Giwa was summoned for questioning by the intelligence services, this time the State Security Service SSS. Lieutenant Colonel Ajibola Tunde Togun, Deputy Director of the SSS, interviewed Dele Giwa together with Re Epu. Police officials, including Deputy Inspector General of Police Victor Palm, Felis Musa, Emmanuel Ngowe, and Lekan Salami, also questioned Giwa. The SSS summoned Giwa again in October 1986 for questioning at their office on No. 15 Awolowo Road in Ikoi, Lagos. He made a statement to two senior SSS members, Mrs. Aliu and Adeni Jones. Delegiwa was accompanied by his colleague, Re Ekpu. However, Ekpu was instructed to remain outside as Giwa was led into the office of the security conscious Lieutenant Colonel Togun. Giwa was exposed to harsh questioning and severe allegations were leveled against him, including 1. Planning to import arms into Nigeria in order to destabilize the government. 2. Coordinating with socialist student organizations in order to stage a socialist revolution in Nigeria. 3. Preparing a featured story about former Chief of General Staff Ebitu Ukiwe's dismissal. He was also accused of planning to employ Alozie Ogubuaja, a police officer who was suspended following some problems with authorities and a comment he made suggesting that Nigerian military planned coups because they are idle. 
It appears that the Directorate of Military Intelligence had bugged Giwa's phone and intercepted his phone conversation. The allegations triggered a furious exchange of words between Giwa and Togun, which quickly turned into a shouting match. Ismail Agwazo, Director General of the SSS and Police Officer Zakari Biu, who later became noted for his brutal exploit during the Abacha administration, also interviewed Giwa on the gun running issue. Giwa was so surprised by the allegation that he confided in his colleague Ray Eku, saying, if they think this of me, then I am not safe. They are just trying to give a dog a bad name in order to hang it. Delegiwa also reported the incident to renowned human rights lawyer Gani Faremi on the same day. Olufumi Giwa, his wife, received a telephone call from someone in the office of Colonel Halilu Akilu, director of the DMI, asking for her husband. After Fumi informed the caller, that Giwa was not in, the caller collected Giwa's office number from Fumi. A few minutes later, the same person called back, connecting Fumi to Colonel Akilu, who requested Giwa's home address and a physical description of his residence. When Fumi inquired why he wanted the location, Akilu explained that Babangida's ADC would be dropping off an item for Giwa later that day and that he planned to stop over himself. Fumi had spoken to Akilu before, hence recognized his voice. Kayo De Shoinka, Newswatch London bureau chief, was present during this call and stated that he heard Fumi describe Giwa's property to Akilu and inquire if Akilu was planning on the visit. Akilu later explained at the news conference two days later that he wished to visit Dele Giwa in order to prove a Hausa adage that says, if you visit someone in his house, you show him that you are really a friend. But Akilu never visited. The next morning, Akilu had a separate 10-minute phone conversation with Dele Giwa, during which he informed Giwa that the gun running charges had been dropped. This chat took place 40 minutes before two unexpected visitors arrived at Giwa's house. Delegiwa security guard Malha Musa Ladan had gone to the market that morning but had requested his neighbor Malha Musa Zibu to keep watch while he was away. Two men in a white Peugeot 504 salon car showed up outside Giwa's residence at about 11 a.m. One of them was dressed in a white suit while the other was dressed in a black suit. The man in a white suit exited the car and handed Malam Zibu a parcel in a brown hand stitch and padded envelope. After confirming that Giwa was present, he directed Zibo to deliver the parcel to him. After handing over the parcel, the two men drove away without waiting to confirm if Giwa had received the parcel. Billy, Giwa's 19-year-old son, collected the item from Zibo and handed over to his father, Dele, who was in his study with his colleague, Kayo De Shoinka. Billy would later describe the package as heavy, with a white tag bearing Delegua's name and address written on it. The sticker also featured the Nigerian coat of arms and the words, from the office of the CNC. It was also marked as secret and confidential, and one that only addressee should open it. Billy had received similar parcel from the president for the father before. According to Shoinka, when Giwa received the parcel, he exclaimed, this must be from the president. But no one could explain if this was from the president or not till this day. As Dele Giwa opened the parcel, a massive explosion burst through his study, injuring both him and Shoinka. The power of the explosion flung Shoinka across the room and left him deaf for five years, and the whole study was enveloped with fire. The heat from the explosion was so powerful. With the help of sympathizers, Delegiwa was put into a Volkswagen car, still alive but badly injured and taken to First Foundation Hospital in Ikeja, 10 kilometers away, where he died from his injuries. His last words were believed to be when he talked to the friend and said, They got me. On November 8, 1986, he was buried in his ancestral home of Ugwepe Ekweri, near Aochi in Edo State. 
the government promised to carry out investigation into the unfortunate assassination. The Chief of General Staff, Rear Admiral Ai Homo, and the Information Minister, Tony Momo, both promised investigation into the unfortunate incidents. According to Ai Homo, we shall leave no stone unturned in our effort to find the truth, he said. The investigation was assigned to Assistant Commissioner of Police Abu Saf. The police interrogated and took statements from numerous people connected to Giwa, including his ex-wife Florence Itagiwa and Mr. G. Komanteros, chairman of Nigerian Floor Mills Limited, who had threatened Giwa with legal action for publishing articles critical of his company. At one time, Musa Zibu, the man who presented the item to Giwa's son, Billy, identified Florence Itagiwa's driver, Olufemi Olukaye, as the man who handed him the parcel. However, Olukaye was released after interrogation and a search on his home revealed no incriminating material. The police agreed that it was a case of mistaken identity. However, attempts by Abu Bakr Saf to question Akilu, Togun, and Guazo failed. He would later explain as follows. It was therefore desirable that Colonel A.K. Togun the SSS second in command and Colonel Akilu, the DMI, make statements giving their own version of the story. They did not submit themselves for interrogation, let alone write statements to the police. Throughout my investigation, I was unable to reach Colonel H. Akilu and A.K. Togun for questioning because of the position they held in the government. Alhaji Ismail Aguazu who was the Director General of the SSS could not be reached or interrogated for the same reason. They were untouchable, he said. In a report to his boss and the Criminal Investigation Department leader, Deputy Inspector General of Police Chris Omeben, Saf recommended that Akilu and Togun should be interrogated and their homes and offices searched. But in an unusual twist to this, Saf was withdrawn from the case and assigned to an armed robbery investigation in Benin. Human rights lawyer Gani Fayomi, on the other hand, refused to let the case die. In November 1986, Fayomi petitioned Lagos State Director of Public Prosecution James Odunei for private prosecution of Akilu and Togon for murder and conspiracy to commit murder. With appeals and counter-appeals, the case remained in the court and went all the way to the Supreme Court, where Fayemi's application was granted and a prosecution was ordered in 1987. When the case was brought back to the High Court, Akilu and Togon failed to appear and the case was dismissed. In between, Akilu and Togon successfully instituted defamation action against Fayemi and he was ordered to pay 6 million naira in damages. In the year 2000, when Oputa panel was established, Fayemi petitioned the commission to summon Babangida, Akilu, and Togon for explanation. However, all three refused to appear before the commission, but they were represented by their counsels. They obtained a high court order preventing the panel from summoning them. Nevertheless, Fayemi appeared before the panel emotionally holding an image of Giwa's and declared, This is what Babangida did. This is what Akilu did. This is what Togon did. Fayemi alleged that Giwa was assassinated because he was working on a sensational story linking a drug courier named Gloria Okun with the wives of prominent military officers. Denied plans to publish an article on Gloria Okun a year before the Oputa panel. Yakubu Muhammad, deputy CEO of Newswatch, stated, To the best of my knowledge, Delegiwa was not involved in the investigation of Gloria Okun's story. Mohamed claimed that during an editorial meeting, a Newswatch reporter named Bose Lasaki suggested running a story about Okun based on a rumor that Okun had not died but had been secretly flown abroad. Mohamed, however, said the story was dropped and never published due to lack of substance since there was no story in it. So, who killed Delegiwa? 
Many members of the public, including Ghani Fayomi, believe that the government and its security agencies are to blame. But the question you may want to ask is, is it possible that experienced military intelligence officers trained in the art of evasion and subterfuge would be naive enough to call their victim and ask for his address before sending a parcel bomb to kill him? Well, interestingly, the parcel also indicated clearly that it was from the CNC. Could they have been this naive? Well, we may never know exactly. However, Akilu himself also said, I am a trained man. If there were any sinister motive, I could have asked someone to tell me his address. I wouldn't have been stupid enough to phone the wife two times and keep telling her that I am the one phony. But there are those who believe that they may have prepared this defense right from the beginning. So it was a strategic design by the intelligent officers to arrive at this end. Apart from this, there are more strange twists to the story that may or may not be valid anyways. But what's stating here? In an interview published in the October 23, 1993 issue of Tell magazine, one Edmond Kechuku Onyema alleged that he was an accessory to Giwa's death. Onyema claimed to be a former DMI operative and that after Giwa's killing, he and others involved were promised new identities in exchange for leaving the army. He alleged that he was fired because he refused to leave the army. Newswatch magazine also obtained an anonymous handwritten confession dated November 3, 1986 from a police officer who claimed to have been an accessory to Giwa's murder. The letter named two police personnel at the Lukweju police station who allegedly knew Dele Giwa's killers. Those who killed Dele Giwa remain unknown to this day. Please leave your thoughts in the comment section. Click here for detailed story of the assassination of Funcho Williams in Lagos. Remember to like this video and subscribe to his pool media on the bell notification as well. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.